Support for I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere comes from MX Publishing, with the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. And by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. And from listeners like you, who support us through Patreon. Bonus material, thank you gifts, and more await at patreon.com slash I Hear of Sherlock. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 278, Belanger Books. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a strong man. In a world where it's always 1895, it's I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. Your Holmes the meddler. Holmes the busybody. Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. Ha! The game's afoot as we interview authors, editors, creators, and other prominent Sherlockians on various aspects of the great detective in popular culture. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Bert Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Hello and welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, boy, are you are you booked up for the holiday season? Not only am I booked up for the holiday season, I'm indexed and cataloged. Oh, that is lovely. Well, and my wife introduced the Dewey Decimal System in our house, and I didn't know that Dewey had a category called remainder, but apparently I'm in it. <laughs> I know the feeling. Yeah. I, I certainly know the feeling. Well, uh, I don't know if you're uh, aware of this, but uh, Dewey, was it William Dewey? Was that his first name? I thought it was Trendline. Admiral. <laughs> well, whoever, whichever Dewey it was. Uh, no, it was Huey. Um, he <laughs> teamed up with, uh, I think he teamed up with Monet. And um, together they had a, a real a lot of fun with pointillism. <laughs> Sorry. I, uh, no. <laughs> I don't know if that one's going to make the air. Um, <laughs> well, uh, remainders or not, we are here uh, with the, uh, uh, well, I guess this is the penultimate episode of season 17 here in 2023. Uh, we've got one more show before the calendar rolls over, and it's been a really marvelous year here at I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. And part of the reason it is marvelous is because of our great listeners. Um, as a matter of fact, I was going to do this later in the show, but we did get some uh, some listener mail. Do you, you want to dig into the mailbag? Sure, absolutely. And, okay. We get letters. We get stacks and stacks of letters. All right. Well, <laughs> goodness. Uh we, well, I don't know if we get stacks of letters, but we get letter, so that's good. I must apologize. If there have been uh, missives that have come through, I realize there was a glitch with our email provider and um, belatedly discovered a whole tranche of items in our web-based email system. So um, if you have written to us a comment that I hear of Sherlock.com before and we haven't gotten to it, Sincere apologies, but um, keep trying. Keep trying, because we always do love to hear from you. Well, recently, within the last few days, actually, Bert and I heard from Max McGee, who sent a fan letter in. He, was, he said, um, I was just meditating on the fact that one of the reasons you do, uh, that your podcast is so fun to listen to, <laughs> oh, you're going to regret that soon, Max, is the rapport you two have, and it reminded me of another long-term audio duo. Uh, and Max said they recently donated their car to NPR. And um, Ray Maliazzi hmm. sent him a nice note. It was a form letter, but it was a note. 
Now, Ray Maliazzi, for those of you who may not know, is one half of the Car Talk team. Two brothers, Tom and Ray Maliazzi, in Boston in the 1970s began to put together this program called Car Talk where they would do automotive repair over the phone, which, uh, it, so thinking back on that now, that's a, a pretty bold move. But, but they were great. They were great. I mean, they could diagnose all kinds of problems. You know, people would call them up and say, you know, I've got this 1940, I got this 1962 Studebaker, and every time I go down a hill, I hear this grinding noise. And after a few minutes, they would say, oh, yeah, well, you know, that's a well-known thing, and you got to do this, that, and the other thing. Yeah, well, and they would ask questions. They would try to diagnose it. I mean, almost Sherlock Holmes-like when it came to cars. So, um, but I think the magic of what worked with Car Talk is their rapport with each other and, uh, and the, the fun and the humor. And, you know, they did puzzles and they did other things with listeners. They would tease their producer, et cetera. So it was a whole culture of fun around cars. Well, anyway, Max writes, uh, I was thinking about Click and Clack and somehow, uh, and, and how in addition to their encyclopedic knowledge, extensive research and real world experience, they also brought a sense of joy and whimsy. Your show has a similar yet more formal, thanks in no small part to both of your impeccable grammar and enunciation and elocution and senses of style, though no less joyous and at times surprisingly silly. Just a note to say I appreciate listening to you gents whenever I can in whatever format because it's like listening to two friends with genuine affection and appreciation for one another, and that crack each other up frequently. Uh, do you have a dynamic duo nickname yet? <laughs> and if not, how do you not? The best I could come up with was plugs and doddles, but that hardly seems fitting for gentlemen, gentlemen of your station. Uh, although Monty and Wolder, or even Bert and Monty on their own, do have a classic vaudeville ring to them. Mm. Uh, and that is signed Max McGee from the Notorious Canary Trainers of Madison, Wisconsin, and the Tourists International Science Society of Chicago. Mm. <laughs> Max. Max is a talented uh, magician, among other things, and really appreciated his note. And I've decided to call myself now in perpetuity Dottles, except <laughs> only when I wear my only when I wear my bowler hat. Oh. I, well, I, I guess that means I'm plugs. Yeah. Well, sorry, plugs, I got it. I got in first. Plugs Monty. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's, that's pretty much what I do for a career. I I, I plug myself. Plug things. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Max, th what a delightful note. And we initially uh, referred to "I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere" like uh, car talk meets fresh air for Sherlockians. So you're not far off there. Uh, I think we dropped the mention of Car Talk after uh, Tom had passed away in 2012, sadly. Uh, and I know Car Talk is, uh, had been running um, on the air in podcasts for a while. So um, their, their memory has been kept alive, but we, we haven't really grasped it. But uh, good to see that someone else realized that kind of level of homage and silliness going on here. So mm. um, all I can say is don't podcast like my brother. <laughs> don't drive like my brother. <laughs> don't deduce like my brother. So, well, uh, Max, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And again, if anyone else has comments or would like to give us a piece of your mind, uh, please email us at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. Let's, let's close up the old mailbag. We get better. Okay, well, on with the business of the show. We are here today to give you a wonderful interview with an enterprising young individual, and we will tell you about him right now. Derek Belanger, PSI, is an award-winning author, publisher, and educator most noted for his books and lectures on Sherlock Holmes and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. A number of his books have been number one bestsellers in their categories on Amazon. Derek is co-owner of the publishing company Belanger Books, 
which published the first e-book editions of the original Solar Ponds books by August Derleth. Derek is a board member of Dr. Watson's Neglected Patients, the Denver-based Sherlockian Society, and in 2019 was inducted into the Pride Street Irregulars. In January 2020, Mr. Belanger was awarded the Susan Z. Diamond Award in recognition of outstanding efforts to introduce young people to Sherlock Holmes. His story, The Adventure of the Misquoted Macbeth, was selected for inclusion in the best mystery stories of the year. He currently resides in Broomfield, Colorado. Derek Belanger, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's, it's a privilege to be here. Well, Derek, your name is known throughout the I Hear of Sherlock.com universe. You've been a writer for our site for some time. You've got your own uh, publishing house. Uh, but before we get into some of that, why don't we go back to the very beginnings and talk about where you first met Sherlock Holmes? Um, I actually got into Holmes through Doyle's uh, horror stories, believe it or not. I'm, I'm one of the, the unusual ones there. <laughs> this is interesting <laughs> I, already. <laughs> yeah. So I, I had read um, The Horror of the Heights and, and just that's still one of my absolute favorite stories. Um, and then, you know, through, through that, I was like, I got to read more of this Doyle guy <laughs> when I was back. And this is back when I was in middle school. Um, you know, and then I read study in Scarlet. That was the first Sherlock Holmes book uh, that I read or, or th this. I, I wonder if I read something before then, but that my memory is on that. And, you know, I got to the part where, um, we get to the, the switch, the part two. And I'm like, wow, like we have this like, amazing detective story. And then suddenly we're in the desert in America, in Utah. And I was hooked. I, I know a lot of people say, oh, that's such a weird transition. But I just like, this is brilliant. And, and I read them, you know, all of them after that. Wow. You may be, Derek, you may be the first person, I think you are, who ever <laughs> yeah. enthused about the American section of A Study in Scarlet. That's that's <laughs> worth an award. <laughs> and I think one of the first who uh, mentioned coming to us through a non-Sherlockian Doyle story. How um, did you in encounter horror in yeah. the Heights in it was middle in school? It was in an anthology, to be honest with you. It was in, and I honestly, um, I think it was one I just like got on my own, like a collection of like horror in the sky stories or something like that. And, and like, just, just like, wow, you know, this isn't quite like, this is an amazing story. Um, it, it's just so over the top and it's so like, imaginative that there's this jungle up in the sky of these giant jellyfish flying above us. I mean, it's just an amazing <laughs> piece of fiction. Fiction? Wait a minute. I, <laughs> wait a minute. Yeah. I, you, mean, you mean to tell me all these times when I've flown on aircraft and put my head in a sack, I was just wasting, <laughs> wasting the effort? You mean there aren't giant jellyfish in un the upper atmosphere? <laughs> Unfortunately... As far as we know, I mean, maybe we oh, haven't hit that right spot, right, but right. maybe there's no jungle or you flown, the air jungle. <laughs> well, that's better. That's, that's be that makes me feel a little better. Though. But I mean, that was an interesting time because we were just 10 years or so into the, uh, not discovery, but into the advent of uh, airborne travel, you know, the Wright brothers having made their flight just about 10 years before. So it really was an era of new exploration, um, humans literally going to new heights. Oh. And it was unknown what's up there, just as so much of the ocean is unknown from exploration at this point as well. So, you know, Conan Doyle was um, particularly on point to try to capitalize on something that was so current and so uncertain and so much in the public's fascination and and i think that's one of the great talents he had so derek as you have had experience with doyle and his many writings and sherlock holmes over the course of your uh your career here um talk to us a little bit about what you've seen in terms of what captures the public's fascination with stories 
You're talking. I mean, I think if you're talking specifically Sherlock Holmes stories, um, is it that um, area? I think it's one. It's the friendship between Holmes and Watson. I, I think we cannot shortchange that at all. I, I think that is crucial to why the stories are so successful. Um, I think it's the fact that we kind of see Holmes through Watson's eyes um, and we, we get to follow this great detective. And I think he's Holmes represents what's good. Um, we want to be like Sherlock Holmes. We want to help others, the downtrodden. Um, you know, he's very good at helping everyone. Um, and so I think that that's really a big piece of it is the morality of the great detective. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that, that's fair. And it's something that's universal. You know, I mean, it, it worked in the late Victorian era. It works today here in the bright blue 21st century. So uh, right. kind of a, hum- a universal human truth there. I mean, I think, you know, and I, I mentioned the friendship because I think that's why like, going from the past to the present, the show Sherlock works so well, just the, um, the relationship between the Holmes and Watson in that series is spot on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and friendships, uh, you know, now more than ever, I think right. as, we, as, as we look at people fanning out over the globe and so many relationships happening electronically now, certainly during the pandemic, um, those friendships, I think, are more rare and more to be cherished than ever before. And, and having a great example like Holmes and Watson, this perennial duo, um, doesn't really get much better than that. I mean, Christopher Morley himself called it out as the textbook of friendship. Mm. And on we go. Mm. Well, yeah, very true. So, Derek, what um, after that great experience of horror, horror in the Heights... What um, what was your sort of Sherlockian path? How did you how did you evolve into a publishing titan? Um, that's it's quite, it's quite a story. <laughs> um, you know, it, I I never really uh, intended to um, become a Sherlock Holmes publisher or even a writer. I mean, I loved the the canon. Um, didn't necessarily seek out pastiche. Um, until fairly recently, actually. Um, and so back in 2012, 2011, 2012, um, I kind of landed in with this publisher that, that is now doesn't exist. And they were putting together uh, a collection of Doyle horror stories. So here we are back to the horror. <laughs> and and I, I let them know, I'm like, oh, you have to include, and I put all these stories and I said, here's why you have to include them. And the guy wrote back and said, you probably know way more about this than we do. I think you should be the one putting it together. <laughs> uh, and so I did. Uh, I put together um, a book and, and titled it A Study in Terror um, and got it together. And then the publisher went out of business. So that was bad luck now, then. Now, now those two things are they connected or un- <laughs> unconnected to? <laughs> What's that? They're they're not connected, are they? Those two things, the going out no, of no, business. No, no, and no, you're no, 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 they, no, 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 <laughs> no. That that happened before I got the book to them. Oh, I think, okay. I think Derek would have saved them, Bert. <laughs> yeah. have saved, well, I just want to make sure our listeners aren't confused. Oh, sure, no. sure. I, <laughs> I did not put them out of business. I barely knew them. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, I ended up taking the collection. I tried to go um, more the academic route, um, but that didn't end up working. Um, and so um, ended up, you know, publishing uh, the books through MX. Um, it was the first time I had worked uh, with MX. Um, and so I did that. And, and through that collection, I ended up meeting like David Markham, which was very cool. Um, and then just a few doing that for a little bit, um, after a a year or so, Brian and I, um, my brother, of course, my partner for Belanger books decided, you know, we want to kind of do our own Sherlock Holmes type thing. Cause we have a very clear vision that we want to do traditional Sherlock Holmes books. Even if we veer into, you know, some odd ones like into science fiction realm or horror realm, Holmes and Watson have to be the traditional Doylean 
Sherlock Holmes and Watson. And so that was what kind of drove us into um, starting Belanger Books. Um, and then the oh, first book, yeah. Oh, that's go ahead. great. That's great. That's great. So it's really what you were talking about before the friendship between Holmes and Watson and the traditional view of these two characters really propelled you forward. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, and so like our first book was uh, called Beyond Watson, which is interesting because it it's a collection of Sherlock Holmes stories that don't have Watson in them. Um, and that was the first one that I edited and that got us started. Um, and then basically what we've done since then, it was just kind of come up with anthology ideas we think are interesting um, and kind of go and, and get them created. And th- we've been very successful. Um, we've grown quite a following over the last, it'll be 10 years in um, 2025. So um, we're, we're getting um, a nice fan base and, and we're just keep going with it. And it's a lot of fun. Well, I think that's ultimately it, isn't it? I mean, if you weren't having fun, this, this would really be a slog. Right. Um, <laughs> so uh, in, in terms of putting together your collections, um, do you and Brian typically look for uh, a project lead, an editor to take this on, or is this something that you are uh, personally invested in? It, you know, it's, well, we're personally invested in all of them. <laughs> just because, sure, like we well, said, sure, yeah. like I said, if, yeah. like, if it's something we don't want, you know, it just we'll pass on it. Um, but it, it depends sometimes. So um, sometimes I will edit a, a collection. Um, Brian is editing his first by himself collection called Sherlock Holmes Takes the Stage, um, which will come out next year. Um, but like some of the um, ones realms like Sherlock Holmes and the realms of HG Wells. I edited with, um, uh, C Edward Davis. That was a lot of fun. Um, sometimes I come up with an idea and I offer it to someone like, um, David Markham did, um, before Baker street for us, which is a series of Sherlock Holmes adventures that take place, um, before Holmes lived in Baker street. So a lot of Montague street adventures, um, and um, Richard Ryan uh, is doing the Year of Mystery series for us. And for that one, um, every like starts in 1881 and every month is a different adventure. So you get 12 stories in the year. Hmm. That's a lot of fun. So um, early on, it, it seems like early on, maybe you can correct me on the timing if I'm off here, but Um, you began to use Kickstarter as part of uh, developing your following. Um, Talk to us a little bit about the the thinking behind this. Why Kickstarter? Why was it right for you? And uh, talk about it in terms of your business model and how it actually allows you to publish these books. Sure. And and the Kickstarter actually is is fantastic we've done it the first book we put out the beyond watson um we did a kickstarter for and just to kind of see if we could do it to uh one get some funds but two also just to start building momentum and start building the community um and it's worked really well um we have never had a kickstarter fail um and we're going on like i said we're getting into like eight years now that we've been doing this um, and then, um, this past year we had our most successful Kickstarter ever. We did Sherlock Holmes adventures in the realms of HP Lovecraft. Mm. Um, and it was, it was a huge success. So, um, it works really well. I think it, it's interesting because the audience that buys through Kickstarter isn't necessarily the audience that buys like through Barnes and Noble or Amazon. So it, it also gets us to a different audience and, um, we can interact more with that audience too, because they can write back and forth and that's kind of fun as well. So what do you, what do you think is different about the Kickstarter audience that causes them to be, <laughs> I, I guess a little more fervent or, or, <laughs> or a little more interested. What, what have you, what have you learned about your reading audiences that way? I mean, I think the big thing is that they feel, you know, they're part of it. They're bringing the book to life because they're investing in it by, by backing the project. Like this is something they want, um, which is exciting. 
Um, sometimes we've done rewards where um, we put the names of the backers in a special section in the book um, and that, you know, they become a part of the book that way. And that that's also very exciting. Um, we do author interviews in some of our Kickstarters as updates and, and people really like that. They uh, respond quite well to that and write about, oh, you know, I'm glad you had that author in. I bought their other collection. So it's been really cool. Um, and it's just because it's so interactive and I think that's just part of social media. Um, I think that's the key to why the Kickstarters might be different than a typical bookstore uh, audience. Yeah, I think you're right. That's I think that's terrific insight there because it is people really resonate to having a community and you're giving them an opportunity, you know, to say, yeah, I respond very well to that and now I can make a difference. I can help help bring it to life. So how big is the um for those folks who don't know, how big is the Belanger book catalog now? It's over a hundred books now. Um, so we we publish, yeah. So we're publishing, you know, between one and two dozen books a year, um, is about, is about our size. And, you know, our, our model isn't like, you know, we're not like a big business. (laughs) So in a sense, we're doing it. Part of it is fun. So if we, um, you know, get a bunch of projects that we think are awesome, we might have a busier year. This past year was quite busy. Um, you know, and sometimes we just need to kind of slow down a little bit, um, and maybe develop some projects. And so that's, sometimes we have some of those years. So, um, it kind of ebbs and flows a bit. Um, but it's all, you know, it's a lot of fun, um, Mm. to get all those books out there. Yeah. The holiday season is upon us and 2024 is almost here, which makes it the perfect time to get over to mxpublishing.com and get yourself or someone you care about a 2024 page a day Sherlock Holmes calendar. Following the success of the four volumes of A Study in Illustrations by Mike Foy, an interesting collaboration surfaced between Mike and the best-selling Sherlock Holmes novelist and editor Richard Ryan. The result? This unique and fascinating page-a-day calendar that is perfect for Sherlockians. Each of the 366 days of 2024, yes, that's right, you get an extra day next year, features a different image and some quote from the canon and an on-this-day event. What a great way to celebrate Sherlock Holmes every day and be reminded of the timeless canonical influence in our lives stock is running low so hurry and grab yours before they are gone get over to mx publishing in the link in the show notes and if you mention the code i hose cal that's i h o s e c a l i hose cal you'll get five dollars off that's an exclusive for i hear of sherlock everywhere listeners the 2024 Sherlock Holmes page a day calendar from MX Publishing. Put it on your shopping list today. So what's what's exciting you now? And when you look ahead, what are you getting excited about? Um, we're going to do some really cool projects um, in 2024. Um, we're going to do the third book in the um, re- writing home series. Um, so we're going to do seeing homes um, next year. Uh, and that what that's a series to do with Bob Katz um, and Rich Ryan and my brother and I, um, and we do a collection of essays each time um, we've done reading homes will come out this week. We did writing homes last year um, and then seeing homes will be for 2024. So that when I'm, real excited about. Um, We're going to do, for the first time ever, a play. Um, David Stewart Davies wrote a Mycroft play, um, and he's going to have us publish the play, and we're also going to produce an audio version of it. Wow. Um, So that's going to be real exciting. Um, And then um, I mentioned my brother's book, uh, Sherlock Holmes Takes the Stage. So that'll be pretty exciting. Um, And then David Markham, is working on a new collection of uh, American Solar Ponds adventures. Um, so that'll be a fun anthology, which will probably come out 
next year as well. So those are just some of them. We also are doing a project with the Strand Magazine and another one with Gillette Castle, but I, I can't get into those too much yet uh, because we do want those to be a bit of a surprise when they're announced next year. Wow. Well, <laughs> that is a lot and it's all exciting. And I should, by way of uh, just a personal admission, Derek, let you know that the very first Sherlockian society meeting I went to was held in the Great Hall at Gillette Castle. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. It was oh, I all, love that place. It was all downhill from there. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, you know, think about it. You know, you're you're a you're a teenager. This is your first uh, interaction with Sherlockians, and you walk into Gillette Castle wow. of all places, and you're made to feel as welcome as if you had been a member there for years. And that's yeah. just symbolic of uh, what the Sherlockian movement is all about, or has been to yeah. me at least. You know, you know, yeah. this summer, Scott. Um, Brian and I in June, we got invited. We got to go into their archives. Um, it, it was very exciting. And we got to hold the letter um, that Doyle wrote to Gillette, uh, congratulating him on on the anniversary of his performance. So like, it was just, it's amazing that place. And we're very excited to be working with them. Um, they're just wonderful people. And, and it, that, that castle is just gorgeous. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, please keep us in mind as you break news there. We'd be happy to share it uh, with our readers and our listeners as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I should say, speaking of things that, um, you know, we should, we should explain our personal interest and personal engagement in some of these things. Uh, and particularly for those of our listeners who have not been lucky enough to find a book or an anthology from Belanger Books. The anthology you mentioned, Reading Homes, which is a 2023 edition, includes some, some this is the sort of thing that's, that's in some of these, in, in one of these books. And the way it's organized, so Reading Homes, you know, you could imagine, well, pretty much anything. But there are a couple of sections here. One is on commentary on the canon. And that features, among other things, um, an article by our friend Bruce Harris about chronologies, and also Stephen Doyle has written about the Encyclopedia Sherlockiana, and Curtis Armstrong wrote about how the annotated Sherlock Holmes by Bill Baring Gould changed his life. Then there's a section on reference works, there's a section on editions of the canon and annotated versions. So Ray Betzner has written about the Book of Life, and um, Ray. Uh, Reithmeyer has wrote, written about bending the canon, and there's another article about Sherlock's pulp descendants by Will Murray. And then there's a article that you wrote, Derek, about the chronology conundrum, and then there's a section on biographies of Sherlock Holmes, comic books and graphic novels, uh, canonical stories for education, playing the game. It's really, you know, the the task of assembling not only just the concept conceiving the content that's going to go in there and then arranging for these uh, different essays to be written is really quite remarkable. Yeah. And, and I mean, really it grew into much, much more um, than I expected it to. Um, and this is another one where I, I had come up with the idea for um, writing homes and I had actually first approached Nancy Holder um, to edit it with me. Um, but of course, with her busy schedule, she she just couldn't make it fit. Uh, but she did volunteer to contribute, which was very, very kind of her. Um, but then I approached Rich, Ryan, who then approached Bob, and then and then I brought Brian in, and then suddenly it's this this bigger book than uh, than I expected. and and um, it's been wonderful. Um, the The quality of the essays is is just amazing and and very insightful. Um, everyone you just mentioned is very, very great. Um, also, Les Klinger has that wonderful ending piece about uh, writing about or reading the game. And, and I love that piece as well. So um, just a, a wonderful collection and looking forward to um, adding to it um, with, with the Seeing Homes book next year. Hmm. Well, that is, uh, I, I was going to say writing Reading, uh, you know, to me, the next obvious one would have been the arithmetic homes, but uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't 
think the, <laughs> the sales would have been too great for that one. Um, but uh, talk to us a little bit about solar ponds, because uh, not everyone who is a Sherlockian uh, understands or is perhaps even aware of solar ponds. How does this fit into the world of Sherlock Holmes? Well, the famous story is that um, when August Derleth was 19, he wrote to Doyle uh, asking for more uh, Sherlock Holmes stories, and Doyle said no. <laughs> and then um, he asked if he could write his own Sherlock Holmes stories, and again, Doyle said no. So he's like, well, I'm going to create my own character based on Holmes, make it like Holmes, um, and that's where Solar Ponds um, came about. And... Um, that he wrote he wrote a number of stories more than 60 uh, of the the detective solar ponds and through um, really Luther Norris um, brought about the idea of a, a PSI a, a parade street irregulars very similar to like a, a BSI um, and so over the years there's been scholarship based on ponds there's been the Pontine dossier um, and then there's also been this society. And then there's also been the, of course, the stories, there's been pastiches. And then there's the original, which is kind of strange because it's pastiche based on pastiche, but um, Solar Pons is kind of, it's his own unique character. Um, and he grew over time um, as Derleth wrote later. And so, I mean, they're wonderful stories and they're a lot of fun. Um, and I welcome anybody who um, list, is listening, is interested in Solar Pons or, or the um, Solar Pond Society um, to get in touch with me, and I'd be happy to um, invite you to our next meeting because we're going to have a meeting of the PSI uh, in February. It'll be a virtual meeting, and you can kind of see what it's all about. Hmm. Now, is this an inaugural meeting, or have you met before? We we've met. Um, we actually so um, the group met back in the day. Um, again, with under when Luther Norris was running things, um, and then they kind of stopped, and we brought it back um, when we republished uh, the original Solar Ponds um, books. So um, we are the publishers. Uh, we work with the Durlith Estate, and so we have the rights to to publish the stories um, of the original Solar Ponds. In fact, um, just this past uh, summer. Uh, for the first time, there was Indian editions of the books uh, published mm -hmm. um, through the Hatchet's Yellow uh, book series. So it's been very cool. Wow, that is neat. Um, you know, I had a collection of first edition Solar Ponds books that I thought were in pretty good shape. And, you know, the, the dust jackets had been preserved pretty well. And I just, I wasn't a Solar Ponds fan, and I had inherited the collection from a fellow Sherlockian. So I reached out to Otto Penzler, and I described sure. the collection to him. And uh, there, were, there were actually a few copies of the Pontine dossier in there, some original issues. And uh, Otto made a, what I thought was a very fair offer. And so I boxed them up and sent them his way, and he was going to sell them and do what he does. And upon receipt of the package, I got an email from Otto expressing surprise and delight at the condition of the books. And he doubled his offer based on wow. what he had originally said. So I, uh, first of all, I had to hand it to Otto as a, um, a man of honor, a man of his word, a good businessman, obviously, but a man of honor. Uh, but number two... Uh, it also made me understand that really there is a market out there for solar ponds, for people who do appreciate uh, those stories and the whole universe that uh, Derleth created. Absolutely. I mean, every year um, his first solar ponds collection in RE Sherlock Holmes is always one of our top sellers. So people definitely are reconnecting with the character um, and that was one of the reasons why we really wanted to bring Pons back um, was because we didn't want him to disappear. I mean, we really enjoy the stories. Um, I, I owe a huge uh, amount of gratitude and, and debt to, to David Markham because he really pushed it. Um, and he was the one who got us in touch with the Duralists and, and helped make it happen. 
Um, and then he wrote his uh, first collection of Solar Pond stories. So it, it, it's been great. And the uh, community keeps growing. There's a, a pretty active Sol- Solar Ponds Facebook group. Um, and again, anybody could just look up Solar Ponds on Facebook, could find it and join. And we do uh, monthly discussions of a story um, through chats on Facebook too. So there's lots of ways to connect with the character and, and to seek him out. That's wonderful. And, you know, the added benefit is you guys are absolutely top of mind anytime somebody goes to get their tires checked. <laughs> I, I don't know if anybody out there got that at PSI, pounds per square inch. Uh, <laughs> oh. Sorry. Bert's coming along nicely. That's good. PSI. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I'll be here all week. <laughs> hmm. What's the, in your view, Derek, have you done a mental comparison of ponds and his environment to homes and his environment? Because that, that usually is, or at least in my experience, I got to the end of reading all the 60 cases of Sherlock Holmes, and there's such an inevitable sadness when that happens. And that's when years ago, I found solar ponds, and I just read through all the solar pond stories too. But do you, have you thought a little? Have you thought at all about about the comparison? Oh, a lot. I mean, you can't help but compare the two. Um, you know, and I, I believe Roger Johnson written about like you know you can't help but solar ponds is Sherlock Holmes, but he's not. <laughs> you know, and so it's interesting uh, to to kind of compare them um, and to see. Because of course they both have doctor assistants, you know, um, Doctor Parker or, or Doctor Watson, and um, they both have housekeepers, um, and, and they both have a residence that's similar. Uh, but there's a difference in the time periods. Um, the, uh, there's ca- a lot of more cars in the solar ponds. One in the solar ponds one, unlike Holmes, started connecting to the pulps as well. I mean, there's a Fu Manchu character who's who's one of the main villains, at least he shows up in a, in a number of stories for Solar Ponds, which, you know, you wouldn't get that uh, in, in Sherlock Holmes. So there's a difference in that sense, too. And, and as the time went on, um, the stories get a little more noir and a little more gritty just because of the time of the, the 40s and 50s. Yeah, well, that's a good assessment. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So... Uh, What's interesting to me, Derek, is as you laid out the vision for Belanger Books, um, you know, how to differentiate yourself from the other Sherlockian publishers out there, you you said to yourself, hey, we are staying with the traditional uh, Holmes and Watson type stories. And you've managed to still stay true to that vision, even though you've evolved to include solar ponds. And and what I mean by that is the spirit of the relationship of the characters is still very much the same. And as you think about uh, potential opportunities in the future, do you think there's anything else like that that might come up that might diverge from the true Holmes path, but still stay true to the spirit of it? You know, I mean, some might say just doing things like Holmes in the realms of H.P. Lovecraft or in the realms of Wells by its nature is diverting. Um, but I think you can divert and still keep the traditional Holmes there. Like, you know, and we did do a, a collection of stories where um, – homes and ponds team up. Um, we, you know, and, and again, I still think you can keep that traditional homes as well. I mean, if we're going to do something different, we'll do something that's just non Sherlockian. Cause we do occasionally, in fact, next year, uh, we're going to start a weird fiction line, um, which will be new. And, uh, John Linwood Grant is going to be the editor of that collection. And I'm really looking forward to that because that just expands our audience. But Sherlock Holmes is always going to be the heart of Belanger books. Mm. And bringing us back to where we were at the beginning of this conversation, you mentioned getting your started, getting your start in the world of Sherlock Holmes via Horror of the Heights. You see any room for horror or some of other, uh, some of those other type of 
pieces of fiction that Doyle wrote that are adventure stories, maybe personality based, but uh, are also are, are not necessarily in the realm of Sherlock Holmes. Yes, actually, um, I can give you two examples. <laughs> Margie Deck uh, just wrote this amazing collection of. She actually did two. She did two really great collections, uh, but she did one in particular on um, Doyle's uh, sequels, specifically um, to Doyle's uh, horror and gothic stories. And her book's called The Genius of the Place. And she would have like one of, she'd have Doyle's story first and then her sequel after. And it, it's a wonderful book. And that actually comes out on Thursday. Um, and then coming out tomorrow is the latest edition of Steel True Blade Straight, which is the journal we do um, associated with the Arthur Conan Doyle Society. And so half of that book is new, is essays about Doyle and pastiche is based on Doyle's non Sherlock Holmes writing. Um, and actually going full circle here, I actually, for that one, wrote a sequel to Horror of the Heights this year. So that's definitely going full circle. Um, but is that's a, also fun. Is it a submarine uh, adventure or how, how does it work? <laughs> with my, uh, it's it's what really happened to the um, pilot in Horror of the Heights is how I, I wrote it. That's so fascinating. fascinating. Yeah. 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 Oh, I so, love that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Derek, you are a font of surprises. This has uh, just been a delightful conversation, and there is so much more for people to discover. We will have links to all of these things, certainly to Belanger Books, to your Kickstarter site, to the uh, Solar Ponds Facebook group, um, and, and everything else we've talked about so people can find their way through your wonderful catalog and wonderful offerings and, uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the Baker Street Irregulars weekend. Yes, looking forward to it. We will have um, a booth in the merchant's room on Saturday, so or a table, I should say. Um, so if anyone is, is listening, and I'm sure a lot of you who are listening will be there, please come by and say hello. Perfect. And, and tell Derek you heard him on High Here of Sherlock Everywhere, and he'll give you a wink and a nod. <laughs> and, and a dinner roll, yeah. Give you a, a dinner roll, <laughs> slightly stale dinner roll. There we go. Hang on to those, Derek. Thanks so much for joining us here on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thank you for having me on. I had no idea of the design of the scope of the Belanger books catalog. And I loved his discussion of the thought that goes into framing up the editorial focus of the anthologies, because he's really creating something new with that editorial design. And I should have mentioned that in reading Holmes, the book that um, we did talk briefly about, I also, I have an essay in there all about, commentaries on the canon, going into um, sort of the, his, the approach to, to writing about the cases of Sherlock Holmes and what some of the, at least in my view, what some of the cornerstone books have been over the years. Well, that's marvelous. I'm so glad you were able to, uh, to do that. And, you know, as I was listening to Derek talk about the evolution of Belanger books and their, their scope and their focus and adding solar ponds, it struck me that there are a precious few, um, I don't know if you'd call them legendary, but certainly well-known and well-respected stories out there, collections of stories, that follow in that same model. Solar ponds is certainly among the top, but so are the Dr. Thorndike stories, and so are the Nero Wolf stories, where you've got some you know, brainy detective and his sidekick that brings an added bit of life, an added bit of reality to it, uh, that make these stories a heck of a lot of fun to read over and over again. The Sherlock Holmes Review is back with articles on Sherlockian film and television, classic canonical scholarship, detective stories, illustrators, collecting, and more. In the latest annual, 
Curtis Armstrong tells how his love of Sherlock Holmes and acting first came together, how he starred in his first radio series, The Baker Street Theater, while he was still in high school, his encounter with Sherlock Holmes, Hugh Laurie and Lynn manuel Miranda, when he featured in the TV series House, how Sherlock Holmes crossed into his character in the WB series Supernatural, and his role as Inspector Gregson in the audible drama Moriarty, The Devil's Game. The Sherlock Holmes Review is back, combining great design with great writing, welcoming fans of every age and attitude. Get the latest issue, the 2022 annual, at wessexpress.com today. Okay, it's time for everyone's favorite Sherlockian quiz program. That's right, it's Canonical Couplets, where we give you two lines of poetry, and you need to return to us with the Sherlock Holmes story in question. If you recall, the last time we were around these parts, we gave you this clue. The killer was a big, good-hearted dunce, as bees swing in the bottle showed at once. Okay, Bert, (laughs) over to you. Dare I ask, do you know the answer to this episode's canonical couplet? Yes, yeah, of course. It's the case where one of Holmes's clients disrupted Mrs. Hudson's cooking routine and damaged her creme caramel. It's the case Watson called the crooked flan. Surely you can't be serious. (laughs) I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. <laughs> well, uh, you've done it again, Magoo. Uh, you you have failed miserably, mm, but well. you have succeeded uh, because you've entertained us once again with your wit and wisdom, or at least your wit. <laughs> or half of my wit. Yeah, there you go. Well, uh, yeah, we uh, we're going to have to take a no on this one, mm. um, but. You are in good company because our friend Eric Deckers uh, came back to us. He said it was rather serendipitous that a recent Trifles episode was about bears and that you referenced Yogi Bear because it gave us a clue as to this week's canonical couplet. It's the story where Yogi stole Lady Brackenstall's picnic basket and greatly irritated Ranger Smith. It's the adventure of... The Krabby Ranger. Wait, wait, Eric says, that doesn't sound right at all. I think it's more likely to be the adventure of the Abbey Grange. Mm, Wow, there you go, Eric. You indeed do have it right (laughs) this time around. So, uh, let's see. We will uh, head over to the spinning prize wheel and uh, give it a little push, a spin, uh, anything we can to get it moving. There it goes. Ah, number of entries this time, and now it's landing on number 37. 37, and that looks like it is Mary McKay Eaton. Well, Mary, thank you so much for your entry. Congratulations to you. I know you are a... uh, a new arrival on these shores, so that's a good thing. Uh, Mary writes, thank you so very much for your delightful series. I've come to it hideously late, and I'm very slowly working through your back catalog of shows. And uh, and she's subscribed to Patreon, she says. Thank you so much, Mary. Oh, bless her. Well, uh, the prize that you get this time around is a ticket to... Watch the Sherlock Mondays episode that is uh, going to be a ticketed event, a paid ticketed event, where they speak about the Hound of the Baskervilles. And that is generously uh, gifted to us uh, from uh, Ed Pettit, who, who heard the show after he was done. He said, I would like to donate that ticket myself. So thank you so much for that, Ed. And now... The canonical couplet for this episode, which will get you a Belanger book of your choice, is as follows. 
the best three-quarter Richmond ever had. No laurels gained as husband or dad. If you know the answer to this canonical couplet, put it in an email addressed to comment at IHearOfSherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line. If your correct answer is among all of them and we choose you at random, you'll win. Good luck. All right, all right, all right. Well, I think we need to uh, get to the news bag now, Bert. We are full of news here at I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. It's not only all the news that fits to print, it's all the news that fits in this episode. So thank you for uh, staying with us so far. Uh, what news story ought we begin with, Bert? Well, we could begin with a anticipated Lucy Worsley special on the BBC. Mm. Now, I gather this is running now. It is. In the UK, and it'll be uh, running in the States in the year ahead, I think. Mm-hmm. And I... the um, coverage of this in the... In, uh, in the um, Guardian newspaper seems to be around whether or not Arthur Conan Doyle resented Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> and I don't think there is any evidence that he actually wrote a note to Holmes saying, you know, you cur. <laughs> How could you? But uh, what do I know? I'm not Lucy Warsley. Yeah. Well, the, the, the coverage I've seen in the past few days about this is... Um, Kind of ridiculous. It's been this this breathless coverage of this quote unquote discovery that a Doyle resented Holmes. Uh, like, well, this isn't really news. <laughs> I mean, it's something we've. I mean, he did kill him at one point, mm. and he very clearly did indicate that he thought his historical novels ought to be given more weight. Uh, so this isn't exactly what you would dis- uh, you call breaking news here <laughs> on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. No. Uh, well, you know, it's uh, we live in a world of clickbait. And, um, yes. You know, insert name here, the word secretly, and then uh, a word, the next word has got to be something emotive. You know, yeah. so insert name here, secretly hated, loved, loathed, despised plan to kill you know this is this is how we seem to be arranging stories and throwing them out into the world for people to say oh that sounds interesting i better learn more about that right away so there you are well maybe rather than calling ourselves click and clack we should call ourselves click and bait <laughs> click and bait <laughs> and we get more listeners mm-hmm. well if you are tired of listening to us there's always reading that's an opportunity uh, issue 15 of Sherlock Holmes magazine is out and just by way of reference we had an interview with the editor of Sherlock Holmes magazine Adrian Brady, on episode 206 we'll have a link to that in the show notes but episode 15 has a lovely cover uh, featuring Basil Rathbone with, uh, you know, as Sherlock Holmes in the dressing gown with his violin there. And uh, some of the uh, articles inside this issue include uh, the enduring appeal of Sherlock Holmes on stage, why theater producers keep returning to Sherlock. Um, Related to that is staging the Speckled Band, the story of Conan Doyle's stage play. They do a tribute to Gail Hunnicutt, who played Irene Adler in the Granada version of Sherlock Holmes in um, A Scandal in Bohemia. Um, A closer look at magnifying glasses and microscopes, um, canonical transport, and lots and lots of other things as well. So you might want to check out Sherlock Holmes magazine. Yeah, Adrian does a terrific job and has added so much to the Sherlockian world. And it's it's really a tough job producing and distributing and printing and doing it worldwide. So yeah. kudos to Adrian. And then you mentioned a few minutes ago in the quiz when, when we awarded the prize for listening to Sherlock Mondays about the Hound 
that you and I have been invited to make an appearance on the 18th of December when Sherlock Monday's episode 14 delves into the blue carbuncle. So we're looking forward to that. That's going to be a lot of fun. And if you don't get to watch it or listen to it live uh, on December 18th, you can always go back and watch the replay. So we will have a link to that in the show notes. Um, just a couple of administrative things. One, uh, we put out an announcement a few days ago that we uh, are abandoning Twitter as a place to find us. Uh, we're not going to get into the reasons, but just suffice it to say that we can be found elsewhere. Uh, we have a link tree that has all of our current socials on it. It's just link tree slash I hear of Sherlock. Um, but we will be putting more effort into f- certainly Facebook and uh, occasionally Instagram and the related threads. And we've been cajoled by a few people to get over to Blue Sky as well. So we're going to try them out. We can't spread ourselves too thin, but just uh, know that our current social media whereabouts can be found on our Linktree link, and that's in the show notes. Mm. And what about our MySpace page? Uh, you know, I've been I've been trying to get the band back together because you know MySpace has become more musical in nature now. So oh, oh. Um, I, I was trying to resurrect the speckled band and see if we could put out an album. Oh, I think they all have the measles, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they changed their name to Spotted Dick, so uh, it's it's much more appealing that way. I bet the band, I bet there is a band that's got that name. Oh, probably, probably. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, uh, for our Patreon supporters, uh, I've noticed a glitch in the Matrix. Uh, I thought that those who had been supporting us at the mug level, which I think was $5 a month, um, those should have been automatically going out from the fine people that run Patreon, but evidently uh, I've heard from uh, a couple of supporters that they have not received theirs yet. So um, stay tuned in, on that regard. We'll be trying to get to that, try to fix it, um, to do everything I can not to have to do them manually again this year, uh, which is always, <laughs> always a bear. That's why we went over to automated. Um, so if you do... Uh, get to Patreon. Just make sure you're selecting the one that is Patreon uh, supported and Patreon executed. So they're the ones that are actually sending out the merch on our behalf. Uh, We will try to make that as clear as possible on our Patreon page. And Patreon promises us that they will be adding a community section there soon. So we will be looking forward to that as well. So thank you once again for your support of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. And um, Don't forget, if you have some feedback in that regard or any other regard, just uh, email us at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. Okay, Bert, rounding the corner into the holidays. Um, You're you're headed up to Boston later today, aren't you? Tomorrow, tomorrow, going up. Uh, seeing some of our friends up there and uh, visiting with the friends of Irene Adler, a group that will be having a dinner um, on Friday evening. And it's nice to see that group coming back together. Their traditional meal is always goose. So it's uh, another Mm. nod to Henry Baker and the Blue Carbuncle. Uh, I miss that a lot. And uh, just for our listeners, so they're not crazy, today is Friday. So um, we're just <laughs> oh, right, Bert's getting right. his recording date and his release date mixed up. So right, right. Um, we will, we will not release you into the wild until it is entirely appropriate, Bert. You'll be kept did, in the how home how for the uh, I think it's the Massachusetts home for the recently bewildered. <laughs> the bewildered. <laughs> so, okay. Well, enjoy your time in Boston. Say hi to all the goose laden people up there at the mm-hmm. Friends of Irene Adler. And uh, in the meantime, I guess you'll join me in saying to everyone else, the game's a foot. A foot. <laughs> <laughs> the game's a foot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. 
Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. 